back to an American Homestead, podcasting live from deep within the Ozark Mountains at an elevation of 2,200 feet. It's 9 p.m. Central, 10 Eastern, and it's good to be back. I've got a lot of good stuff for you tonight. Uh, some really interesting articles I want to share with you. I know you're going to enjoy them. Uh, you'll have to check them out. Uh, all of the links are going to be in the description below tonight, so you can follow along uh, with the articles uh, with the show, so that way you're not getting lost. You know where we're at. Uh, the links are all in the description, so check them out. And um, let's see. Got a whole stack of stuff. Jamie's got a whole stack of stuff, it looks like, over here, too. She's busy typing on her computer. And um, it's going to be a really interesting show. Got some news for you and um, all kinds of updates. So let's go ahead and get into it. What did we do this week? What did we do? What did you do this week? <laughs> I, uh, I worked on the sawmill. I've got my coffee. Because it's the late, late show on the Homestead Network. But it's decaf. So? Okay. It's, it's still coffee. Well, I'm just it makes saying my, it's decaf. It, makes, so you're not it gonna... makes me think that I'm not tired. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what you working on? We'll start there. Well, I'm always thinking about our next homeschool stage. And um, Joshua is reading up a storm like... I can't keep him in books. Like every time I turn around, he's done with another book. And so I'm constantly on the library's website ordering more books. Our library is really small. And so um, we have interlibrary loan, which I take advantage of. And so I'm always on the library website every week going through. It seems like every Saturday night, that's what I do is get on the library website and order the books for the next week. And so I'm working on homeschooling stuff now. Um, somebody asked a question last week that I didn't get to answer, but somebody asked um, about homeschooling curriculum. One of my absolute favorite, favorite curriculums that I've found is called Beautiful Feet. If you don't know about it, you need to because... What they have done is pure genius, in my opinion, because they have taken history and brought it to life by using actual chapter books and children's picture books. And so when you're studying history, instead of pulling out a textbook, you're pulling out an actual storybook, reading the story and discussing it. and it's hist- some of it is a little bit of fiction, but most of it is just history written in the perspective of a story so that children can actually latch on to it and feel like this is interesting. They can relate to this. It's not just memorizing dates or points of time in history. It's actually learning about real people. And it's called Beautiful Feet. And if you don't know about it, you need to look into it because... I really feel like if you can learn something, children learn best when it's given to them in a story form. Yeah. I'm like, don't you think, like, Zach always loved history. That was my favorite. That was my favorite subject in school. And I never did. And I don't think that maybe, maybe part of the reason was that I, it just was never given to me in a way that I could relate to. But but wait a minute. You liked I mean, is that the reason you liked Little House on the Prairie when I love that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it was in story form. Mm-hmm. All right, we're gonna talk about that tonight. So um I see some of the things you have jotted down here. Uh Frontier Life, French and Indian War, some of the topics that you want to start covering, early colonies. Well, we've been working on Plymouth right now, and there's some really cool books out there um for the Plymouth stories. Not so much related to Thanksgiving, although, you know, that's what you automatically think of. But you don't think about um, why they came to America, you know, what the struggles that they faced. Oh, we just hear about it was religious persecution and, you know, that's about it. They wanted religious freedom. Right. It was always about land. Like, you know, lately I've been thinking about this in relation to homesteading. And I've been looking at American history in relation to homesteading. And um, it's so crazy, the connections. Like, the pilgrims came 
to America because they wanted to be free to do what they wanted to do on their own land. Mm -hmm. And like, isn't that the reason like most of you out there, that's the reason why we want a homestead. Yeah. It's because, be to, yeah, we want be our own get out, land. Go out my back door and shoot my gun whenever I want and, you know, have chickens in my yard if I want and have livestock and and not have to worry about it. And so and I, when, I, when I lived in Europe, it, it became very evident to me there at a young age that there is no land anymore. It's all gone. I mean, there's wide open spaces in Europe, you see, but it's all owned. And it's very heavily, heavily regulated. And it's been that way since the time the pilgrims came over here. I mean, mm-hmm. it's. I mean, it was the king's land. It was the Church of England's land. It was right. the. It was the the crown's land. It, it was not your land. And even back then, it was heavily regulated. And the only way you got land, if you weren't a, 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 some sort of lord or, or kinship to the king, was if you left and went somewhere else. And and to me, uh, settling America, that's what it's always been about. It's always about been about the homesteader. From the people who first set up the first colonies here in America. Um, it's always been about homesteading. Yeah, exactly. It's always been about homesteading. So, um, anyway, so. Some I'm, of the titles you got here Exploring I'm the West. Working on, we've, we've been working on Plymouth, but we're going to move on to the early colonies. She's got one on here I was noticing earlier. It's, it's called George Washington's Breakfast. It's a children's book about George Washington. And what he had for breakfast. Well, I've never read it. I'm going to borrow it from the <laughs> library. But it's an award-winning children's title. Anybody else out there? And the chat time. We usually do chat. Um, hey, guys, if this is your first time tuning in. Welcome to the show. Uh, but we do chat normally at about 15 minutes till the end of the hour. Uh, so we won't be in the chat till then. But if you've ever read this book or if you have any kids that have this book, you know, let me know what George Washington had for breakfast. I'd like to know. <laughs> Um, Zach. We can just skip ahead to the end. Um, folks, uh, if you're tuning in for the first time and you like podcasts, you can find lots of MP3 downloaders on your favorite browser, Chrome, Firefox, or Explorer. And uh, you can download this podcast in a podcasting form, MP3 uh, type download format, and listen to us in your car or when you're jogging or whatever, when you're exercising, whatever. Uh, but you can do that. Uh, we, we know a lot of people ask about that. So that's how you do it. You download these podcasts. Just search your favorite browser for a YouTube MP3 downloader. And uh, the Homestead Network, you can check out that website, thehomesteadnetwork.com slash showtimes and see other amazing uh, Homestead uh, YouTube channels and see what they're doing. Uh, Lots of Homestead channels that do the same things we do and uh, put together some really good info. So check it out over at thehomesteadnetwork.com. Let's see what else we do this week. Um, We worked some more in the garden. Um, I put a lot of straw down, some more straw. The garden is completely ready for planting now. Um... I have some cabbages coming up. I have some lettuce coming up. I have some straw. So there's some strawberries coming up. Um, we have uh, carrots coming up. We have potatoes coming up. We have uh, lots of garlic coming up. We're going to do some amazing garlic. Remember the we did some amazing, uh, what was it called? What did we do last year? How we weaved it. We didn't weave it. We th- What do you call oh, that? Oh, it's a braid. Uh, braided it. We braided garlic. Yeah, that's right. I can't yeah. remember. And so we're going to do that again this year. And... Um, uh, probably do another video on that. So there's lots of stuff growing out there. Lots more stuff being pl- going to be planted soon. Um, I'm going to be doing some corn. I'm going to be doing some lots of tomatoes. I got tomatoes growing and peppers growing. So um, lots of stuff going on in the garden. So we're, we worked on that this week. And um, the kids learned the Davy Crockett song. They've been learning that for the last couple weeks. It's been going on for a couple weeks. But yeah, they've got most of the verses down now. It's hilarious because now it's running through my head constantly. <laughs> yeah, it's just it, it just it, it was getting kind of annoying there. There was like multiple days. Well, we decided um, to let the boys watch the old old Disney Davy Crockett with Fess Parker, and so they've been enthralled with Davy Crockett and. We have a coonskin cap. It's actually synthetic, but it's, you know. Yeah, it's not real. We'll get a real one yeah. eventually. I got, I got to kill one again. <laughs> and so they've each been taking their turn wearing that, and they run around the homestead with their rifles. Um, Caleb has taken wood and taped it together with duct tape to make his own rifle. Here's a... Uh... You guys probably recognize this. 
Green estate in the land of the free. Raised in the woods so he knew every tree. Killed him a bar when he was only three. Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Anyway, so that's the music we've been playing in our house for the last couple weeks. Um, and uh, a lot of you probably remember that song and are familiar with it. Uh, I certainly am. I grew up listening to that and uh, watching that, and I was a big fan of David Crockett. read all the books I could on David Crockett when I was a kid and uh, just found it completely fascinating, and it really contributed to um, the woodsman in me coming out in my later life. Yeah. So um, anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Let's see. Um, but they, yeah, they've watched. I think they've watched all the episodes of that, and they've memorized. I think every single verse written on that song. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for this past couple weeks. So, <laughs> um, and also, folks, it's like uh, mushroom season. Uh, we found our first morels this past week, and I did a video on it, and so I put that up online. And so, if you're interested, you can go check out over at the YouTube channel the video on on finding some of our first morels. There's more of them popping up. I saw a few more that came up this past week. And so um, I'm going to head back out after we just had a good rain all yesterday, uh, all last night. It rained and rained and rained and, and, and drizzled most of the day today. So the, the ground is wet. The mushrooms will be coming out. We got some good 70 degree weather coming and 50 degree nights coming on the way. So the mushrooms are going to be popping and they're going to be popping good. Also, we have our shiitake mushrooms that are going to be coming up soon. Uh, the shiitakes, uh, they are um, going to be uh, popping out of the log pile, piles. We've done videos on that before. So if you're interested, you can go over to the YouTube channels and search for our shiitake mushroom videos. So we've already done some harvest on that, but we're gonna, we, we uh, inoculated a lot more logs. So we're going to have a lot more um, uh, uh, shiitake mushrooms coming up. And then we have the wine cap mushrooms we planted in the garden. They should be coming up maybe this spring and then also this fall. So we planted that last last uh, fall, and so they may be you know spreading out, and hopefully we'll be start seeing them. And I'm thinking about getting a hold of Field and Forest and ordering some more mycelium uh, from uh, that magazine catalog and getting some more wine cap mushrooms going because I just think I, I don't think you can have enough. And I think once you inoculate an area, if you keep feeding that area and allow some of them to go to spawn or to spores. Uh, they will continue to reproduce. So it's, it's something that will reproduce for you for years to come if you keep feeding it and treating it properly. So um, uh, if you want, we've done videos on the catalog over at Field and Forest, and then you can find that video over at our YouTube channel. Other than that, we did an interview. I did an interview this week with Self-Reliance School, um, and I'll include a link in the description below if you're interested. It was an hour-long interview. They asked all kinds of questions about living off-grid. Did you see this? This is the article right here. They did. They used our picture with the, the sorghum or the sugar cane. Yeah. And so uh, that's that. Uh, it, was, it, it was up this week. It's live now. You can watch it over at selfrelianceschool.com. There's a link in the description below. They ask us all kinds of questions about uh, you know leaving the city and what it was like and and how we got started and, and all that stuff and what we grow and, and animals, livestock, chickens, all that stuff is, is talked about. Sorghum is all talked about in the, in the hour-long interview. So if you're interested in that, uh, once you're finished with the show, head on over there and check it out. Let's see. So um, every week, it's you know kind of a little bit of a chore of mine. Not a big deal, but I always try to find something we can talk about. And so I found an article that I think would be great for Jamie to read on the air. And it's called Lessons of Little House on the Prairie. And I think it's just not that long of an, art, of an article. So I think she would enjoy it because she really liked Little House on the Prairie. And I grew up watching it. But it was, I don't know, it was more of a girl's, girl's, it was more of a chick flick. But see, here's the deal. Like, I think that you never gave it a chance. I did. I watched it all growing up. But there was plenty of boy stuff in that. I mean, do you remember Albert? I remember Albert, but it was mostly about Laura. But she wasn't a girly girl. Well, okay, right. I get it. But still, I mean... It It was just a kid's show. It was. It was okay. I mean, I watched it all growing up. I remember it was on at 10 o'clock in the morning every day, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 a.m., it wasn't on at 10 a.m. in my house. And I believe it was on but... Channel 30, St. Louis, 
St. Louis, whatever channel 30 was I back in St. Louis. I don't remember what it I, All I remember, it was on in the afternoon um, when I lived with my grandma when we were here in the United States. And um, that was the only time I ever watched it was when we were here living with her. It well, was on the afternoon. I grew up watching it. I just, it was okay. It was just, I watched it, but it wasn't, you know, I don't think it didn't stick with me like it did, it did with you. But Plus, you read the books, didn't you? I read the books when I was in second grade. Okay, so it's a while ago. First and first or second grade. Well, here is the article. I'm going to give the, the laptop. She has her own laptop. She's going to have to move to get to mine here. So um, we're going to let her read the article. I think she's going to enjoy the article, and you're going to enjoy listening to her read it. So um, let me position this a little bit better so she can get to it. You got it? Okay. Okay. There we go. All right, so here we go. I haven't read this before, you this guys. Is, this is from a Walkerland uh, homestead blog. We like to share different blogs out there in the blogosphere when it comes to homesteading. Walkerland is someone I'm familiar with. Uh, they write a lot of good articles, so check them out. And, again, link is in the description below, so if you want to follow along with Jamie reading, you can. And you can stop and comment during any part of this <laughs> because I'm sure you're going to have something to say about it. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Here at Walkerland, we have taken to watching old episodes of Little House on the Prairie. This has been going on for a week or so now, and honestly, it has had a fairly, fairly large impact on me for a variety of reasons. The first thing is this. The morality displayed on the show is incredible. In fact, I suspect that simply playing the role, I'm sorry, playing the show for kids over and over would result in better kids than many parents are capable of turning out on their own. I routinely feel like a louse while watching it, as some of the decisions the characters make are so intuitively good, my own moral inferiority lies in stark contrast. I am not a bad guy, but compared to Charles Ingalls, for example, I'm a lazy scrub. And his wife? Wow, what a powerful woman. It is kind of unrealistic to compare yourself to a fictional character on a television show. This I realize. At the same time, why not? If you see an example of someone or something that inspires you, does it matter where it came from? Charles Ingalls was, for me, one of the foundational fictional characters of my youth. As a boy... I watched many episodes of Little House on the Prairie. I think back to what an advantage that was. It seems so silly, but do kids today have the opportunity to turn on the television and receive an instant lesson on morality, independence, self-sufficiency? We got rid of our, table, or our cable television years and years ago, so I cannot say what modern television today looks like. However, being a gambling man, I'd wager, sight unseen, that I could put... Little House on the Prairie. Oh, I'm That's sorry. Just, just the, it's the acronym. Yeah. That I could put Little House on the Prairie up against anything currently out there and as a way to teach morality, personal responsibility, and caring for one another, nothing would come within a thousand miles of it. So, while my head as a child was filled with stories of an independent family making do for themselves against all odds, what do kids of today get to watch? Garbage. That's what... The show is incredibly refreshing to watch, as none of the current societal afflictions are present. I love the interaction between the two main characters, the husband and wife. Charles is the man of the house, and there is no question he is the man of the house. And yet his wife, Caroline, she rules the house. There is no squabble for dominance and no question as to roles. He takes care of his stuff, oversees hers. She takes care of her stuff, oversees his. When one is weak, the other steps in. The lack of tension over gender roles is gender roles is also remarkably refreshing. Charles earns the bacon generally. Caroline runs the home generally. In partnership, they raise a family. Within those roles, though, things bleed over. Caroline raises chickens and sells them to the local store. Charles does take an active role in parenting, although breadwinning is always his priority. It's that or starvation. There is one episode where the family is destitute because of a failed wheat harvest. Charles goes away to work. He meets a guy on the road who takes him and a third guy to a mining pit where he gets a job working a double jack. He works for a few weeks and just before going home his friend blows himself up. 
He and the third guy take all their wages, put them in a bag, and Charles delivers that bag to the widow. So he keeps none of the money for himself, gives it all to the widow, and shows up home with empty pockets. Well, in his absence, Caroline organized a bunch of farm women, and they all harvested the storm-blasted wheat by hand. They salvaged enough of the crop to eat over the winter. She saved the day. In today's world, at least according to what I see, the man would feel weak, a failure, and the woman she'd be harping on her man for not bringing home any money. There was zero of that. They just loved each other and worked together, covering for each other as necessary, as an implicit integral part of the deal. I think Zach and I function, I would say we function this way for the most part. We try to function that way. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, marriage is tricky and, you know, you always have your disagreements. But I think for the most part, we do this pretty well. He doesn't get in my domain and I don't get in his. Don't you think? Yeah. I think all of the uptight feminists of today fighting for things that don't, even make them happy and the bitter lost men who have given up hope of a mate i think of the copious amount of antidepressant and mood altering prescription drugs that are prescribed many of which are relationship related i think of the children who will grow up in a world where the perception of sexual identity is becoming more and more complex by the second where the traditional idea of marriage is being destroyed i think of all of this and i shake my head at how unnecessarily complicated we have made everything I should note that, as far as I'm concerned, do what makes you happy, as long as you hurt no one else. The problem is, everyone jumps on the first concept, but the second, not so much. The general thinking is more, do whatever you want, as long as you make it, as long as it makes you happy. This is so flawed and so small. Television is not real life, and any argument to the contrary is a bad argument. With that said, I challenge you to watch a few episodes and to put yourselves in the minds of these characters. Throw yourself back into the times of the horse and buggy and consider, are these things really that bad? Is this old way of being really that, oh, is this old way of being really that unenlightened? Watch the show when you find tears creeping into your eyes and find yourself asking philosophically, why are we such complete a-holes. You'll understand what I mean. Is that and that's, it? that's the end of the article, right. <clears throat> uh, very good article, and um, I'm, I'm open. I mean, I think it'd be great to watch some more episodes, because I think we've watched episodes in the past, and you know, I, they're definitely better than anything that's... I don't even... Does Netflix even have? You'd probably have to get them on DVD. It's not on streaming. Because I think it's it's a worthwhile show to watch. I read the first book to the boys a long time ago, but um, we never we never picked up the rest of them. It was hard back then to read while Caleb was listening. He's gotten a lot better now. You know, there are so many people that were raised on that show, and I remember when Charles uh, not Charles, but Michael Landon died. I mean, it was. People, because he had the other show that was really successful afterwards. It was called something Angel. Oh, or Highway to Heaven. Highway to Heaven, that's right. And I remember when he died, it was such a huge thing. But it was mostly because of Little House and, and the impact he made on so many people growing up, um, you know, with that show. Yeah. Because people literally grew up with that show. I was one of them. But. Well, we saw it. I think we saw it on reruns. I don't know. I don't know when it originally came out. It was during the 1980s, I'm sure. I'm, I'm not sure. No, mm-mm, that was reruns. What? Okay, let's look it up. <laughs> Little, we always do this. <laughs> he doesn't believe me. Okay, I'm looking it up. It was, it's got to be the early. Momentarily, time. we'll see that I'm right. 1974. <laughs> 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 okay, so I grew up, I grew up on reruns. Uh, but wait a minute. It says right here. Uh, all right, look. 1983. I'm sure I saw some of them. You know, I was, but I was born no, in 76. But the tail end of it, you never saw. Like the last episodes, the like the last um, year or so. Yeah. They never re-ran those in syndication. They, they always just did the first ones. Yeah, probably. So when Laura was little and the, all the girls were little before she got married and s- stuff, yeah, that was what they re-ran over and over. Yeah. And that was before we were born. 
<clears throat> but yeah, anyway. Um, so, <laughs> what? I know, she's always right when she comes to those dates. She remembers the dates really good. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would be a good, it would be a good, um. Yeah, we'll have to see if we can get it to watch. We can see that. But, uh, I, wasn't the article good? I mean, it's just, when yeah. you think about today and what kids have to watch today, it's just garbage. Yeah, I, I don't even like that guy in the article. Like, I don't even really know what's out there because. We haven't had TV in forever. Yeah. Yeah, but I hear it's bad. I mean, I look at the articles that come out, and they say, you know, how much nudity on, on TV is present. It's just crazy. So, um, anyway, uh, I thought it would be a great article for her to read, and because I just really think it nailed home what we're looking at in the, around the world today, you know, the world around us, and just how messed up it is, and how people just hate everyone else, and it's all about do what feels good to you, and who cares what anyone else thinks. Because um, that's exactly what it is today, and um, it's sad. It's sad. But, um, you know, I really, I, at the beginning of the article, he makes the point that you could probably turn out a better kid just by sitting him down in front of Little House all day. Yeah, but than I don't a kid. think that kids today would even, if if they're addicted to other TV, I'm not sure that they would okay. want to watch it. Right. You're, you're, you're absolutely probably right. They're, I mean, they're like, what is this, like? You know, they would probably think it's too boring. Yeah. But other, I mean, our kids would not do think that. I mean, if you started off kids that way, though, they would get a better better education on morality and what is right and wrong. Yeah, but our kids were entertained by Davy Crockett from the 1950s. Yeah. Oh, the world's messed up, folks. The world's messed up. Um, anyway, I thought I'd share some other articles with you. Let's keep moving on. Because I have a whole bunch of stuff, and I don't want to end up like last week where I got only to one article and left everything else on the table. Uh, there's a lot of Facebook homesteading trading posts that are out there, uh, guys, and um, I, w- I put one in the description below. And it's, it's a homesteading trading post on Facebook, and I think there's multiple ones, but this one, it is they got all kinds of stuff on there. They've got goats for sale. They've got wood lumber for sale. They've got all kinds of things. And I know it's all over the country, but it's just a pretty cool indication of what other people who are homesteading, what are they doing to make money? How are they trading and bartering with each other to get by? And I think that's helpful for people to see what other homesteads are doing. So um, there's a link in the description below to a particular trading post for what's called a homesteading trading post. It's a closed group, so you may have to join before you see it, but they have all kinds of things where they're bartering and trading, compost with each other, um, assistance in tractoring. Um, one person I thought was really cool, they're, they're trading chaga, which I believe is a, a type of mushroom, and um, $20 a pound plus shipping. And so she's harvesting this mushroom and she's selling it on the trading post. Did you know it's illegal in Arkansas, here in Arkansas, to find morel mushrooms and to sell them? You're not allowed to take them to a farmer's market. In Missouri, um, one, of the, one of the largest and oldest farmer's markets in the country, it's called Soulard Market. It's been there since the 1800s um, when St. Louis was a trading town. It's called Soulard Market, and every year they have tons of morel mushrooms that come in from the woods of, of the, river, the river valleys in the area from the Missouri and the Mississippi and the Merrimack Rivers, and, um, and people sell their morel mushrooms in the springtime, and it's illegal in Arkansas. In some states, I think you need a permit even to pick them, but um, I don't know if, there would, if it would be illegal to post them on a trading post, a homestead trading post like this one. But anyway, it's uh, this person here is selling mushrooms. Um, you have other people uh, selling land. So hey, listen, folks, some of you guys out there, you're looking for land. You know, going on these homestead trading posts, there are people out there selling, you know, possible homestead land, and some of it, you know, doesn't look all that bad. This one person is selling land in California, which I don't understand at all because you'd think you'd be wanting to get out of California, which is probably why they're selling the land in California. They want to leave. But uh, this person here is selling it in California. But there's other places on here where they're selling land. So it'd be good. maybe it's a good spot for you. You might find your perfect homestead area uh, on some of these channels. This one guy here, he's selling uh, these Anorak Boreal shirts. I guess they're made of wool. That looks really neat, don't you think? 
Yeah, anorak. I don't know what that is. I don't know. But I think it's made of wool. And um, this is a guy in Ga- Galesville, Wisconsin. And he's on the Homestead Trading Post. And he's making these homemade uh, jackets. They're like pullovers with a hoodie. But they're really cool looking. And they look really warm. They're, they're made of wool. Mm. Yeah, I don't... It, it doesn't say that, but okay. No, but I, I checked it out. They're, they're oh, they are? Yeah. Oh, uh-huh, yeah. all right. Yeah, they're, they're made of wool. I mean, it looks like wool too, doesn't it? Yeah, it yeah. looks like it. Looks pretty cool. Lots of cool stuff like that. Um, you know, check it out. And then there's other groups out there too. You know, just go out and search for a homesteading or trading post. Um, off, there's all kinds of things that deal with people who are selling animals and they're trading and bartering between each other, which each other, which I think is a really good idea for us to do. Uh, so be be aware that that those things are out there. People ask me all the time, you know, where can I find land? And I give them advice. This is another place where you can find homesteading products and land for sale. Check it out. Um, let's see what's next. Um, there's an article here. Uh, speaking of Little House on the Prairie and you know our four year old learning about history and things like that, there was a offthegridnews.com article where a boy takes a bullet to school, a bullet shell. It was a casing of a 22 casing. And his preschool officials suspended him for a week, and they called child services. That's horrible. <laughs> little four-year-old put a little shell casing in his pocket and took it to school, and the, the teacher found it, and they suspended him, and they called child services. I have just, so many stories about shell casings. <laughs> I, know, I, know. I mean, I mean, it's just it's just part of being a boy. It's it's just it's the the woman said that I was met with a stone faced teacher who said that my son had a shotgun bullet, and she, she said I was horrified, thinking where could he have gotten this? But all it was was a shell casing of a twenty two. Yeah, she had no idea what she was talking about, teacher. Anyway, um, can't she say it was empty? Yeah, seven day school suspension. Um, which she was, of course, expected to pay tuition still for that seven-day school suspension. And, um, and a threat that if his enthusiasm for guns continued, he'd be permanently expelled because he, he was running around the, the recesses going bang, bang, you know, playing guns with the other kids. And, you know. I, I don't <laughs> know how you get that out of boys. I, I mean, I really don't. No, I mean it's it's just ingrained in their in their it's just part of being a boy. It's not something that I've ever taught them. They just do it. They just do it. They turn everything into a gun. It doesn't matter what it is. Well, they see dad having a gun and, you know, it's just I don't know. It, I I seriously doubt you could you could stop this from from happening. Um, but it's just the insanity that our world has gotten to. Yeah. I mean, what would a teacher like that Think about Little House in the Prairie because they had guns. Did they have guns on the show? Yeah, they hunted. Well, they had, yeah, they had rifles. They didn't have handguns. Not really, but there was handguns on the show every once in a while. I remember a few instances where there were. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, they had, they had rifles and they hunted. Oh, just insane. So that's our world today, folks. Um, again, the article's linked in the description below. Uh, be interesting to take that article and share it on your Facebook pages to get the feedback from others and see what their opinions are as well. Good article to share for a lot of cool feedback. Um, Another thing I thought was cool, Jamie might like this too, is um, an article over at goodhomedesign.com. It's a cabin built out of three shipping containers. And uh, it's got pictures to go along with it. So again, the link is in the description below so you can follow along with this. But it's three shipping containers tied together that someone has built for a tiny home. And... I don't know what you guys think about tiny homes, but I think tiny homes are, especially like this, are a great way to get into something and not have a lot of debt out of it. It says each container was bought for $3,400. Okay. And he, he worked on these containers into a cozy cabin, it says. So the cabin is spacious, measuring 355 square feet, which isn't bad, you know. It's not too small. Not too small. I mean, if you're a couple, that would be... Perfect. Yeah. That's a perfect first, you know, beginning of marriage cabin 
that you can get into and not owe any money on, not owe a lot of money on, pay it off if you had to, because it's not much money, and then work at building a bigger house for your family. Yeah. That would be that would be a great starter house. There's so many mistakes Zach and I made early on. So many or financial mistakes we made early on. And I wish that someone had sat us down and gave us a good stern talking to about how to succeed in finances. And number one on the list would have been only live somewhere where you can afford. Like if you have to go in debt for it, Don't then it. It, it's not worth it. Yeah, it's not worth it. And I know that, you know, there's a lot of people out there, you know, who say, you know, it's it's an investment, a home is an investment, but uh, if you can if you can at all do it, just try to get it so that you don't have to have a payment. Yeah. Anyway, nice little tiny home. Um, the next page has more pictures, so I wanted to have Jamie look at that too and see what she thought. But um, I know what I think you'd think, but I'm going to let you say it first. Mm, what do I think? Well, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is, the, this is it right here. I'm looking at, we're looking at the pictures on um, the link in the description, so you can click on that and watch it. Um, well, the pictures are taken with some kind of a broad lens, right? So I think it looks bigger than it probably actually is. Right. Um, looks like they haven't enclosed the bathroom. Well, that was one thing. We'll get to that in a minute. But there's no windows on the, the other side. So with the close the doors, there's no windows. I thought, I thought you'd so, want more window light because you like window light. Yeah, I do. But, you know, it's electric. Yeah, they're gonna have they're gonna have lighting on the inside. So you see, the, they've they've wired it for electric. Um, it says the unfortunately the cabin is not equipped with a toilet. Installing one would require permission from the local authority because of the septic tank. The owner hasn't decided yet to settle down in one location. One location, but the cabin is designed to have a toilet space just in case he changes his mind in the future. Which my suggestion, and I posted at the link in the bottom of the article. You can see my comment below. Is to, hey, use the humanure. You don't need septic. And you don't need permission. Yeah, but close in the bathroom first. Oh, yeah, they need to close or the bathroom. at least to have some kind of... <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but... I guess if you were single, it wouldn't matter. But still... If you're, uh, Either way. No company for you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, no company but yeah it closed the bathroom but other than that it's a nice little house for the for what the guy said he paid for it and what he you know what he built on it. i don't know how much the interior de decorating and you know flooring cost looks like i'm not sure where he maybe got a deal on that or you know obviously the wood stove and you know what the couch cost but not a lot of money sunk into that great for a first year home or a first couple home and you know their first year of marriage and uh, not owing a lot of debt on a house you could get by with that. Absolutely get by with that. No doubt about it. So I uh, thought you might enjoy that. And then the last article we'll go through is um, there's some companion plants in your garden that really boost your tomato crop. And so I um, posted that in the description below. Let me go over here and click on that and bring that article up because I think I closed it earlier. So it says, these companion plants in your garden will really boost your tomato crop. And our garden is looking good for this year. We're going to be doing some amazing garden garden stuff. And so things you can plant along with your tomatoes. And the one that caught my eye was the French marigolds. Um, people, I know a lot of people who plant marigold flowers with their tomatoes to help protect them against nematodes and other um, uh, garden pests. There's a, I think there's a variety of pests that they say marigolds um, will repel. Uh, it says here white flies, tomato worms, slugs, and other garden pests. But also, I learned this week that the wine cap mushrooms we planted in our garden, they also attack the nematodes that atta attack uh, tomato plants. So wine cap mushrooms, again, I'm going to be I'm going to be beating a dead horse on, on the mushrooms thing, guys. It's an easy, easy, easy way to grow a food source in your garden along with everything else because as these other tomatoes and other things come up in your garden during the fall, those things cast shadows on the ground. Those tomatoes and other pepper plants, all that foliage 
cast shadow on the ground and they really help those wine cap mushrooms to come up. And those wine cap mushrooms, the mycelium from those mushrooms help protect the plants like the tomatoes and the peppers and all those things. It, it helps uh, uh, is a deterrence and it kills nematodes, uh, n the non-beneficial nematodes that will attack your plants. So really cool thing to grow, a very easy food source is the, is the wine cap mushrooms and other mushrooms too. But the French marigolds, that when I saw that in the article, it caught my eye. Um, carrots says benefit ne uh, tomatoes by breaking up the soil around the tomatoes, which allows more air, nutrients, and water into the roots of the tomato plant. And tomatoes return the f favor by secreting a natural insecticide, solanine, that carrots can absorb, which I never heard of before. I, I never read that. So really cool, interesting stuff in that. Um, garlic it says also helpful because it repels spider mites. Bury garlic cloves one inch into the ground around tomato plants for a natural insecticide. I never knew about you know growing garlic around tomato plants. Uh, I do have garlic in the ground already, but usually by the time my tomato plants are coming up, uh, my garlic has already been harvested. So um, not really sure about that, but you know you could try, I guess. Um, other than that, great article. Thought you guys would enjoy it. I try to share different homesteading articles from around the internet every week so that you guys can get the most out of our show, learn the most out of the show just like we do, and uh, be able to share these articles yourself on your own social media. So be sure to do that. Share these articles. The people who run, who I mean, some of these are big companies, uh, homesteadingnews.com and offthegridnews.com, but uh, some of these um, homestead websites are just small guys, you know, who are just, you know, blogging as a hobby or as a part-time job, and, and they can use the share, so do that. Um, all right, okay, over to the chat room. Let's go to the chat room and see what you guys say. Hey, listen, if you guys have questions, put them in all caps. If we don't see them, uh, please post them again because we're obviously answering uh, multiple questions from people, and so... Go ahead and uh, if we don't answer it, post it again. Post it in all caps. And be sure, folks, go ahead and give us a thumbs up on, on the chat tonight or on the video tonight. It'd be, we really appreciate you guys when you go ahead and hit that thumbs up button. It makes a lot of difference. So uh, Kevin wants to know what's a good science homeschool curriculum. You just got a new science curriculum this year, oh, didn't you? Oh, yeah. We're really, really this is actually my first investment in a science program. I've been trying to do some things myself and Joshua is really, really loving it. Um, it's called, Oh, I always get it wrong. I'm going to look it up so I can spell it right. She's typing. Okay. So it's called no -E -O science. It's N-O-E-O. -E and if you go to Logos Press Online, Logos Press Online, and look for Noeo, um, it's a Greek word from what I understand. But I love it because it's taking books um, from the secular world that are good, really just colorful, um, packed full of knowledge, and using those books to put together a curriculum. So basically every day it's, it pulls parts out of those books and says, read this today. And then the kid gets to make their own notebook. If you're familiar with notebooking, uh, we really love that because notebooking, the kids get to write down what they are interested in, what they have remembered, instead of just answering a bunch of workbook questions or some straight rote questions that they're expected to know. I think that um, notebooking is an excellent way for children to write down what they remember and what they are interested in. And that's why I love this science curriculum. Plus, it's really hands-on. It comes with um, science kits. It comes with a whole book of science experiments with using things just from your home. Um, yeah, I can't really say enough about it. We love it. And um, someone said, Jamie, Hinty and Ballantyne are great authors for the kids to read. Where? I'm not sure. I, I don't know how to pronounce that. Hinty. Huh. Okay. Thanks for the tip. I'll look into it. Hinty and Ballantyne. And then um, someone wants to know, do I grow apples? We don't grow apples because they don't grow well here. 
There are a lot of apple orchards. Uh, in fact, this part of the country was known for its apple orchards for a while because they had so many of them. And then the cedar rust came in and so many of the other diseases that affect apples came in and just destroyed uh, the apple orchards uh, in mass here. Folks, apples grow great in some parts of the country. They don't grow great in some other parts. So in Washington apples, you always hear about Washington apples. Pacific Northwest, great place for growing apples. And there's apples that grow great in other places. But um, in the Ozarks, what grows really well here is peaches. Um, like the Georgia peaches, you know, that's on the south too. It's got a lot of heat. Peaches do well here. Um, uh, blackberries do well here. Blueberries do really well here. People have a lot of blueberries. But uh, apples, you can grow them here, but chances are, unless you're really going to put some soaps and some other things on your trees every year to keep the cedar rust off and other diseases, they're not going to last very long. And we didn't know that until, you know, after we bought some apple trees. But it's just the way it is. Um, how large is your home? We have, it's 990 square feet about. Uh, I think 970, something like that. Something like that. 970 square feet. Um, it's it's good size home for us, for a family of four. Mm-hmm. It, uh, you know, we don't have we don't have to buy hire a maid to clean it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jamie, my sourdough starter flopped. I live one county away from you. Any chance you could teach me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just threw out my starter because this time of year, um, unless you have an air conditioned home, it, it got it got hot yeah. um, and the house got into the lower 80s. And when that happens, I throw out my starter. It's not worth keeping it because I have to feed it multiple times a day. Um, when it gets hot, your sourdough requires more food you have to feed it more it's eating more um those bacteria are chewing away and it, it's not worth it to me so janet that may be what happened you know your sourdough got hot because uh, if you only live one county away from us you were probably hot too unless i mean unless you didn't have your air conditioning on and it was hot in the house it probably you, you didn't feed your starter yeah enough. i don't know if you had it going previously and whether it worked out um it could be a number of things could be the flour you're using. Uh, Hubbard Homesteadish once uh, says you can make garlic oil with some of that garlic. That sounds interesting. Garlic oil. Mm-hmm. Okay, like infused oil. How do we do that? I assume. Do we have to press it? I don't know how to do that. I think most most people just um, put the garlic into olive oil. Oh. It's infused oil. All right, Hubbard. But I don't know if that's what she means all right we need details hubbard homesteadish i need details details um let's see ordered my kennebec potato starts today any recommendations for good storing for a good storing squash yes um if you can buy the squash we have listed on our website we only have a few packs left of seeds there's only a few packs like four last time i heard there was like four packs left so um, the, the squash we have on our website, it's called the Ozark Mountain Potato. And it, I mean, we still have three squash, three giant squash in the kitchen right now that were harvested last fall. And they're completely fine to eat. They store perfectly well in an unair conditioned home, unheated home, you know, wood stove heated home. So if you want a good storing squash, the, the Ozark Mountain Potato, we're selling on our website. I think there's like four packs of seeds left. Unless we uh, cut open these other potato uh, squash we have here, these big ones. I mean, they're big. They get big, guys, big. Um, unless we um, cut some of those open and save those seeds, they're, they're, all the seeds are gone, except for the ones I have for myself. That's it. So um, check that out. Uh, there's only a few left. What is the best antifungal leaf spray for ras? Oh, wait a minute. Wait, what's the other? It's the cal talcata squash. Oh, delicata. Delicata squash. We're going to grow that this year. And I understand that. That keeps pretty well, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Well, it yeah. Doesn't? I mean, it does, but not not like the, the other winter squash we have. Oh, okay. So it won't last a long time? It will, but I would eat it. It's, it's easier to eat because it's soft. I mean, it's small. It, the delicata. We haven't grown. We got these seeds from uh, Shalom Makers, and they're like big on i guess some of the fancy restaurants serve that stuff yeah it was really good it was really good folks really good um 
They're smaller. They're smaller. Much smaller. But the ones we have here that we're growing here and that we have in the kitchen, those things last, you know, they'll last a long time. And like I said, there's only a few seeds left of that, but they'll, they'll keep really well. <laughs> um, Freeze your starter and only thought to feed it. Will that work? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, drummer, but uh, we can't do that. <laughs> and um, historically, they would never have had refrigeration. No. I think that a starter... Um, so what they do 100 years ago. I think they probably threw it out when it got spoiled and started a new one when the fall came around again. So you don't think they had bread in the summer? I don't think they needed bread as much in the summer because well, they had because they all, all the this... food from their garden. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I really don't think that bread was a big staple during the summer. We, we learned long ago when we started researching all this that people ate seasonally. You ate what you had. Hey, you know, a really interesting fact. In the springtime, there's this thing called carnival, and it's these celebrations, and everyone thinks that carnival means farewell to meat, and that was it was put into existence by the, the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic Church, they have the 40 days of Lent where they give up meat. And so Carnival, farewell to meat for these 40 days, that's entirely untrue. Carnival meant that in the springtime, you, there was no more butchering. Because you butchered your, your meat, your, your animals, in the fall and in the winter because you had, you had natural refrigeration of the cold that allowed you to keep that meat and eat that fresh meat for a certain time frame and then also that cold allowed you to take that fresh meat and preserve it by salting it and curing it uh, over time you didn't do that in the summertime because or in the springtime because the temperatures weren't warm enough you would have insects getting on your your meat that you were trying to preserve and your fresh meat and so you didn't do that anymore um so carnival what had was had nothing to do with the church it was always about uh, the springtime approaching and that meant a farewell to fresh meat and you had to start eating the meat in the summertime and the spring and summer of the meat that you were preserved in the fall and winter. And so it was always a farewell to meat in the spring. Really interesting stuff. But um, uh, it says free just, let's see, what does it say? Hinti and Ballantine are free on Kindle if you do ebooks. We don't really do ebooks, do we? No, we don't. Um, it says I make minced garlic, but you need to use dried garlic. For oil? I don't know how. I don't know what they're talking. What's country living? East Oregon style 61. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, how do you make the oil? It says low cooked minced garlic. Oh, wait a minute. I got to go back up. It scrolled out of view. Low cooked minced garlic and olive or coconut oil. Great for earaches and cooking. Low cooked minced garlic. So you infuse. That's what you were talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can butcher a chicken, Donna, you can still butcher a chicken in the summertime and it'd be gone, but it's not a large animal. You don't have a whole bunch of meat. You're going to, when you butcher a chicken, you're going to eat the chicken that day. You know, there's no leftovers, you know, for a family who eats a whole chicken. So, um, but you try to, you try to butcher a cow in the summertime. I mean, it's a pain in the butt. In fact, we had a, uh, some friends of ours who had to butcher a cow in the summer cause it died mm -hmm. and they butchered it and they hated it. It was because the bugs wouldn't leave them alone, the flies were everywhere, and, and they were trying to keep the meat from spoiling because they had to get it vacuum-packed real quick and put it in a fridge. It was just a mess. So you don't do that in the summer. You do that in the fall and winter. Uh, Sanctuary Valley Homestead says, we're going to grow the achicha seeds this year we got from you. Awesome. You're going to love them. Give them something to grow. Give them something to grow on. Um, will a root cellar keep the starter cool enough? It might. But here's the deal. Like, why? I don't know. I mean. If you want bread. It's so easy to start a new one. I don't understand. Someone help me understand this. Well, I mean, if, 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 I mean, I, an, an older starter will taste better. I mean, we've talked about that before. You know how an older starter tastes better. It's just more ferment fermentation that goes on in the bread. Yeah, maybe subtle taste differences, but your bread is still going to rise. Yeah, it'll, it'll still rise. It'll still work. I mean, it's worked for us. But I'm just saying we've noticed the difference with an older starter. It tastes better. Yeah, I I don't know. I'm not. Uh, I mean, we th we throw our starter out every spring anyway before Passover. Uh, 
let's see. Um, what was it on here? I saw a minute ago. Um, I don't know. What was it about? I don't know. I saw a post on here I was going to talk about, and I can't find it now. Maybe I... The book series is way better, Catherine says. I agree, and I want to finish reading the rest of them. But um, one of my rules is, if at all possible, read the book. Always read the book. <laughs> so I'm making, I'm making a rule for Joshua now. Always read the book before you get to watch a movie, if there is a movie. We're going to make... Uh, um a root cellar at some point behind the house. Uh, now that we have the dozer, it's got a giant bucket loader on it. We're going to, we're going to dig out uh, a root cellar for the house. It's just a matter of, of time before we do that, but it's on the list of things to do here coming up soon. Um, age starter is better. Yeah. Um, no more starter. We'll Zach back to the ramen. <laughs> <laughs> No, he just doesn't get the ramen. I do like the ramen. Um, <laughs> he hasn't been eating the ramen. I told her, you know, you got to bring maybe some starter, maybe some sourdough. You know what, though? You barely ate it. I you did barely too. ate the bread. I like starter. I like, I mean, I like the, the sourdough bread. I'm a big sourdough fan. But you barely ate it. Oh, I did. I ate it whenever it was there. It was always there. Uh, are you considering smoked cheeses? Yes. Um, you know, it did not get cold enough very long to do any cheeses this year because you put that in the smokehouse and it's going to be, you got to do it on cold nights. You know, you got to do it on a cold night. Uh, it's a cold smoker, but it still gets a little warm in there and you don't want the cheese to melt. So, um, you do it on cold nights so the cheese doesn't melt, it stays its shape and the smoke, um, does its thing. Uh, but we didn't get cold enough to do a smoked cheese this year. So I was kind of disappointed in that. I was waiting for some good, you know, down, you know, some good nights down in the teens that would be coming so that I could get uh, some cheese ahead of time. But we didn't do that. Let's see. Uh, if you have a spring, make a spring house building a concrete stone building surrounding the spring. I don't have a spring like that. We have a seepage well. That's kind of, a, that's kind of what we have on this homestead. We have a high water table and it's a seepage well. And um, that's why we have it. And so, um, but it's, it's, um, it, it, but it, it, we can't build a house like that on it. So either way, if we do, when we do build um, uh, a shelter, or not a shelter, but a, a, what am I thinking of? A cold, what's it called? Oh, root cellar. Root when, cellar. I, when we do build a root cellar, we're going to have to put in some kind of French drain system inside of it to help you know, keep it drained because we have such a high water table. Anytime you dig around here, it's going to get water. You know, it's just, um, it's amazing. We live on a mountaintop, but we have water. So we're blessed. Um, you only have to smoke the cheese one and a half hours to get a lot of smoke out into it, she says. But we smoke a lot. I, I, I would always, I'd put it in there for a whole day. That's what I would do. I'd put it in there overnight. That's what I would do. One and a half hours. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I've never tried to do that way. Never tried it. We're going to be smoking some more stuff coming up soon. We do, we, we're going to do some more videos at some point with that. But, um, you know, we've done salt. We've done a lot of animals. We've done our deer in there. And, um, you know, it's just, there's lots of things to experiment with. We'll get to it eventually. So, all right, guys. Hope you enjoyed the show. It's about 10 o'clock. Uh, we got some other things we'll bring back next week, some other articles that I wanted to save up, uh, and I'll bring to you then and talk about some other homesteading uh, items from around the web. Uh, please give us a thumbs up if you can. We really appreciate that. And join us again next week for an American Homestead. We'll see you guys next time.